Let me just check something here. One second. Okay. Uh, Jason, uh, what you, remember, we're talking about peripheral tears of the menisci here. What do you think is going on here? Um, I think that the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus looks intact and there's a ligament of Risberg adjacent. Okay, so what do you think this is then? Is that just the recess between the two? Okay, so you're right. You're just calling this a ligament of Risberg? Yeah. Okay, good. And if you look on the coronal images, there's Risberg's ligament coming down and our slice is right in here. And this is just some soft tissue. There were partial volume in right before the Risberg ligament fuses with the posterior horn. So you're right, that's normal. Okay. So, okay. so meniscotibial attachment tear or Risberg variant? Um, so in the sagittal uh, T2, um, in that posterior horn, I mean, I, it looks triangular. It looks like maybe a displaced posterior horn. Okay. Here are the coronal images. Obviously, this patient had recent trauma. So what do you think now? Um, yeah, there's a defect in that yeah. posterior horn yeah. there. So that, th this is a tear. And here, this is actually wrist breaks ligament coming across there. And this is actually... And you can see that this patient had an anterior cruciate ligament tear. That's why you have the bone edema posteriorly here. We'll talk about pivot shift mechanism of injury for an ACL tears that uh, that can lead to tears of the uh, posterior horn. And what happens here is that this is a common location for that kind of a tear because Risberg's ligament comes down and attaches to the uh, medial aspect near near the near the meniscal tibial attachment help stabilize it. If you have a displacement of the femoral condyles due to the ACL, it can displace the lateral component producing a rip in the meniscus there. So this is actually a, a tear uh, right at, uh, in this case, it was Humphrey's ligament, which attaches there. We'll talk about the difference between Humphrey's ligament and Risberg's ligament uh, later when we talk about ligaments. So the you can have some... Uh, Difficult. There are there are other uh, anatomic very uh, anatomic things in the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus peripherally. They can also be a problem, and we'll talk about those later as well. Okay, uh, Robert, what do you think of this case? So we have a coronal in the looks like there's increased signal of that anterior attachment there. Yeah, and this was a uh, a root lesion. And then if if on the fluid sense of images you see fluid going into it, then you can confidently call it a tear. This one actually did not have that. And at surgery, uh this was still grossly intact mechanically, but but it was uh was was abnormal. So it was a kind of a degeneration of the anterior meniscal tibial attachment. Okay, and then we can talk further about meniscal capsular separations. Uh <clears throat> Tayson, what do you think about this? So at the posterior horn of the medial meniscus, there is a defect in the uh, yeah in that posterior aspect of the uh, horn. Uh, I guess where that's where the um, meniscal capsular ligament would be inserting. Okay, so this is on the medial side now. We were on the lateral side before. So we're we're now on the medial side. Okay. Now is there some bone trauma here? And you notice here on the coronal image the anterior cruciate ligament is torn. Okay. So this is really a peripheral tear, which involves a peripheral meniscal tip attachment, but involves the inferior corner of the meniscus as well. So this is another form of meniscal tibial attachment where that you can get with uh, anterior cruciate ligament tears and displacement of the femoral condyles with a pivot shift mechanism of injury. This is on the medial side, so this is what we tend to call a ramp tear. 
And if you remember, if it's inferior, it's unstable. If it's just superiorly, it's stable. Uh, but the main thing is just to recognize in the setting of an ACL that we have an, a, a, per, a acute peripheral tear here that's a ramp tear, and the surgeon will have to address that appropriately at the time of surgery. <laughs> Okay, so we've got a sagittal T2. So um, I'm seeing fluid undercutting the posterior horn. I think the uh -huh. so so this on the medial side, and really the entire periphery looks like it's separated here. Yeah, and it also goes to the inferior surface. So this is also a meniscal capsule separation. If this were in the setting of ACL tear, this would be a ramp tear. This would be one of the later stages, like a four, where both all, all the peripheral attachments here are torn. So this would also be an unstable uh, ramp tear if it were in the setting of an ACL tear. Uh, and the other thing, when you look at these, you can. This is the inferior meniscotibial attachment here, or what's called the coronary ligament. And you can see it was also injured here in this, in this patient. And this is, this is a separate patient, actually. And then we can also see that we have a root tear here. We have an acute root tear separation here and really a, a, a high-grade partial tear of the uh, meniscotibial attachment in this particular patient. <clears throat> So now I'd like to go on and talk about the fascicular anatomy. This is a patient who had trauma and has a fracture, but let's ignore the fracture. What I'd like to look at are the peripheral attachments of the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus. Now, if you're in uh, immediately near the notch of the knee, what you have, you can see, is a superior fascicle or the superior strut, which is a medial structure, uh, which connects the superior margin of the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus to the peripheral tissues. And that's uh, normal. The next cut, we can see it here, and, and that's a nice, normal, superior strut. These used to be important because they could be very confusing if you did arthroscopy, uh, not arthroscopy, uh, uh, arthrography, and you're concerned about posterior horn lateral meniscal tears, sometimes this strut anatomy could be confusing, but we don't, we don't really do those anymore. Uh, so that's an intact superior strut. Now, if we're getting more laterally, there are a couple of things we're seeing. We're seeing a little structure come off the inferior aspect of the posterior and the lateral meniscus. And then back here, we're seeing this particular structure, which if we go more medially, it comes from here. This is the popliteus muscle, popliteus tendon. And then as we go more laterally, there's the popliteus tendon there. And the popliteus tendon is going to go below the superior strut, and above the anterior strut through basically the peripheral attachment of the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus, and then it's going to come up and attach to the lateral femoral epicondyle, right? And you're all familiar with that anatomy, but uh, this is what it... And therefore, you have to have this, these two separate struts here in order to allow access of the popliteus tendon up to its attachment, and you don't have a structure like that on the medial side. And if we go farther laterally, this is the inferior strut. There's the popliteus tendon. There's just a little partial volume of the superior strut, and we can see the popliteus tendon going between the two, uh, where it attaches up here, uh, just underneath the lateral collateral ligament attachment. And then the inferior strut, we can follow it, and it can come all the way down and attach to the peripheral tissues down here. Okay. So that's normal anatomy. Robert, are you next? Can we go back, John? Yes, we can. Tell me which one you want, John. I I have a feeling that we're not talking about the fracture. No, we're not talking about the fracture. That's right. Okay. And that's a pretty important area there. Yeah. So that's a superior strut, inferior strut with the popliteus tendon going between them. Okay. Robert, what do you think of this case? Uh, so we have a sagittal of the, the lateral compartment of the knee. 
Uh, looks like there's fluid uh, posteriorly. So I'd be concerned for like an inferior strut injury. Right. So this is actually an evulsion of the inferior strut or a tear of the inferior strut from the uh, from its attachment there. So that's an inferior strut or inferior fascicle tear. Good. All right. So we are looking at the lateral compartment of the knee on sagittal view, and there is some fluid signal uh, in the posterior horn. Right here? Yeah. Probably uh, inferior strut injury yeah. as well. So here, instead of being torn off its peripheral attachment, it's here torn from the inferior aspect of the uh, lateral meniscus. Okay. Of the lateral meniscus. Okay. So, like so many things in the world, people like to do research on these things. So, they, you need to have some sort of a classification system. And uh, don't memorize all these things, but there is a classification system for this, as you might expect. Type 0 is normal. Type 1 is a torn inferior or superior attachment. Type 2 is both, and torn with a separation there. So, uh, I just put this in just in case anybody ever brings it up. I, I, I don't use this classification system. But I guess if you're doing, going to do research in this area, this might be helpful. Okay. There we are. Mm. Let's see. Okay. So looking at the the body, or maybe the posterior horn, or the lateral meniscus. Yeah, we're, we're in the bodies here. Okay. So irregularity in the periphery. Um, Something about this stuff here. Mm -hmm. Okay. I hear the axial image. Uh, ch -ch -ch. Yeah, just some edema there. Yeah, yeah. possibly some. And some this this is strut injuries. Peripheral tear and meniscal capsular separation, and which would be a type three. Okay. Robert? Uh, so two more sagittal uh, lateral compartment. Uh, there's, looking at the posterior horn, there's increased signal posteriorly there. So I'd be, again, concerned for another meniscal capsular injury. Yeah, here, this is probably the periphery of the meniscus, and here we're seeing a lot of abnormal morphology and thickening and and the thickness of the tissues here in the region of the posterior struts. We'll probably see a little bit of a feeble superior strut here, which looks very abnormal and thinned, uh, and with the popliteus tendon coming underneath it. And uh, this uh, surgically was another meniscal capsule separation with tears of the struts back there. Oh, I'm sorry. So, as you might expect, then, if you have a tear like this, it might weakened the peripheral attachments. Uh, so this patient came back, uh, uh, I think, I forgot, maybe it says how much longer, but I think it was just a few months long, uh, after this study with a re-injury. And here's what the re-injury looked like. So what do you think is going on, Robert? Uh, so it looks like that posterior horn has flipped over anteriorly now. So so this patient actually had an ACL tear. You can tell that because now we have a new impaction injury here in the anterior upright weight-bearing portion of the lateral femoral condyle. That's where you get the typical pivot shift injury. Impaction injury here is a little bit like a hill sacs in the shoulder. And then you get posterior injuries of the medial and lateral tibial plateau. Uh, so this was a weakened uh, with with this injury, it tore and completely displaced. So now now the peripheral attachments are all torn uh, back there. Okay. All right. So we have a sagittal view of the lateral compartment, lateral meniscus, lateral meniscus. Uh, there is some. Irregularity of the anterior horn. Uh, okay, so we see some increased signal there. Yeah. If you go to the next cut, it looks like this. Go back, that's what the, 
this cut looks like. Now, if we go okay. in the other direction, it looks like this. And then if we go farther into the notch of the knee, it looks like this. And then like this. Um, I mean, I see no root attachment at the uh, anterior. Yeah, so the thing is, what is this? Uh, is that a plica? Yeah, well, you can think about it. This is called anterior interval scar. Uh, and uh, uh, if you have scarring and involving uh, post-traumatic scarring involving the uh, office head pad, occasionally it can connect to the anterior horn of the lateral meniscus and, and have traction on the anterior horn of the lateral meniscus, which can lead to chronic pain syndromes. Uh, so this is something, I haven't seen this very often anymore. Maybe it had to do with previous surgical techniques or something, I'm not sure. Uh, but if you saw these, sometimes the surgeons would have to go in and release these in order to uh, improve the patient's pain. And it's called anterior interval scar. And I'm just blacking on the name of the orthopedic surgeon who popularized this. He was a surgeon for the US ski team. I'm sorry, I'm blacking it. So, here we go. Oh, and his name was Dr. Stedman. Hmm. Okay. Vail, Colorado. Right. So sagittal views of the lateral meniscus. Um, not sure. Not sure, I see anything. Uh, okay. So the posterior anterior horns. Yeah. Getting in kind of first notch of the knee. I don't see much there either. This is on 10 28 2010. Uh, this is another cut where we go farther into the to the knee. Mm -hmm. Maybe a little bit of scarring here in Hoffa's fat pad. We go to the axial images. What do you see here? So we see probably what we probably have an anterior cruciate ligament graft with mm -hmm. uh, interference screw here in the in the tibia. Okay, and then now the patient. Let's see, this was 2010. Now the patient come back and comes back in 2013. What do you see now? Uh, similar to the previous case, we're seeing that kind of linear dark signal behind Hoffa's fat pad, maybe an anterior. Scar. And now we're seeing a lot more scarring here, right? Mm -hmm. Before it was pretty puny, maybe not even worth commenting on. Now it's much larger here, uh, which you can see coming across there. And uh, we're seeing this area in here with a little bit of fat in it. The patient had multiple prior surgeries on the axial images. You see this kind of mass like area up here anterior to the meniscus. Mm -hmm. So what would you call this? Mm. Could this be some some form of arthrofibrosis? Yeah, it is. It is a form of arthrofibrosis. And this is also anterior uh, scar tissue, which they, they went in, anterior interval scar, and they went in and kind of resected part of this and removed it, and it was all scar tissue from the. And we'll see other things that have a little bit different mask effects uh, in a minute. That uh, uh, they're also well. When we get to the ACL, we'll talk a little bit more about this and uh, some of the problems you can have here after anterior cruciate ligament graft placements, which can lead to chronic pain syndromes that that need to be resected, and and this is one of them. Mm -hmm. So well, one one of the problems. Uh, why you get these scars in the office area, uh, inferior fat pad, is that uh, you're you're putting your instruments in the wrong place. Usually, it's the it's the scope that uh, produces that problem, and uh, uh, and that means the patient, uh, uh, the doctor, put the scope too too far in centrally and uh 
and, and, and cause too much trauma. But that pet bleeds like crazy, so you, you, you don't want to um, put a scope in there. Although many years ago, when arthroscopy was started, some orthopedic surgeons thought that that's the way to go, was central to avoid other problems. Uh, and they were wrong. Uh, the, you got to stay, stay away from the center uh, and avoid the fat pad. Thank you, John. So now let's talk about meniscal cysts. They can either be inside the meniscus, which is pretty uncommon, or outside the meniscus. I think when we first did a study of these, we had 64, and I think only two were intrameniscal. This was one of them. So here we can see uh, fluid signal intensity within the meniscus. We don't see anything going to an articular surface. This is the T2, the PD, and those particular days. Uh, and this is kind of an intrameniscal cyst. This is really a tear. Uh, generally, we in the, with the old days with the techniques we had, and this was about in the early 1990s. Sometimes we couldn't see the tear going all the way to the surface, so we just kind of presumed that these were tears when you saw fluid collection in them like this. Uh, nowadays, uh, you can usually see the connection to the surface with modern techniques. Let's see who's next? Uh, I think it's you. Me. Okay, Jason, what do you think of this case? All right, we have a uh, coronal T1 in fluid sensitive fat sat of the knee. Looks like a very diminutive and macerated uh, body of the lateral meniscus. It's well, a nice sharp edge there. But we do see this signaling yeah. signal across it to go into the superior um, articular surface. Yeah, and Jason, uh, paraminiscal cyst in the. Uh, yeah. Uh, and probably some bleed, uh, rupture of the paraminiscal cyst with some edema around it. Here are the axial images showing that. Uh, cystic collection coming right adjacent to the body of the lateral meniscus there. And this is a typical parameniscal cyst. And what these are, these are usually degenerative type uh, horizontal uh, tears, which have been there for a while. They act as a one-way valve. When you put pressure into the joint and increase the pressure, or pressure on the joint and increase the pre hydrostatic pressure, forces fluid out. When you take the weight off, this acts as a one-way valve. It stays there, and you kind of keep pumping fluid out there. This is very bright, so it looks like it's fluid, but this is really usually is more of a gelatin. It's not that easy to take out with a small needle because it's usually very viscous and thick uh, in this location. So these are, uh, these are tears. There was some debate a number of years ago about well, what, what these were, but these are just a residual of a tear of the meniscus. Um, it's a horizontal tear usually, and uh, it's a degenerative meniscus that produces it. Um, but there's a connection between the joint and uh, and the meniscus. So uh, the, the treatment most of the time, uh, you may try uh, to aspirate um, that's just using an 18 gauge needle after anesthetizing the area with a small needle, uh, like a 32 or 30, uh, which, which doesn't cause much pain at all when you do insert it. Um, and so, what you do is uh, you aspirate it and put a little cortisone in there. And sometimes that does the trick. What one of the things I used to do is uh, puncture that area multiple times and get some bleeding and and hoping for for uh, scar tissue to form and that's worked in in some of my patients um one of the problems is if there's a small cyst it may not appear when you do the mri so what you should do is have the patient walk around the block for 20 30 minutes and uh, the cyst will show up quite easily on MR, and uh, that's when you do the treatment. But I've seen um, orthopedic surgeons and radiologists miss the 
the cyst, um, although the patient tells you the story that they feel a, a bulge there uh, when after they do their walking uh, and then disappears in the morning when they wake up. So uh, when you get that kind of history, is, um, get them to do a little walking before getting an MRI. Um, Thanks, John. So, um okay so coronal sequence there we see uh kind of horizontal increased signal within the body okay the tear. So it looks like we have a horizontal kind of a degenerative type horizontal tear on this t1 weighted image mm -hmm. and if you look carefully here though you don't see it very well there look like there's some soft tissue thickening that's bulging out the sub -Q Q fat there. If we go to the stir image in this one test study, we can see fluid coming down here, and here's the cyst, which is what's producing this. So this is a pyramidal cyst coming out from this horizontal tear. Uh, so. The main treatment for these, uh, other than what I was talking about, uh, the conservative try and fixing this is to. to do arthroscopy and then uh, go through the meniscus uh, all the way to the periphery and excise um, uh, all, all the um, cysts that, uh, that you can find and then suture the meniscus uh, in place. Thank you, John. Robert, what do you think of this case? So we got two coronals of the knee. Sagittals. Sorry, yes, sagittals. Uh, looks like there's a big, what I'm assuming is a perimeniscal cyst, and then in the anterior horn of the uh, meniscus, it looks like, uh, well, an extension of that cyst, most likely. It's a lot of septa in it. Mm -hmm. Here they have the axial image showing all the septa. So these can become very large. Uh, uh, for the mechanism we talked about, the longer you sit around there pumping uh, joint fluid out into it, the larger these can get and grow over time. Uh, and then that's really the source of the cyst here in this way. That's, yeah. Okay. So, uh, and you can see the actual tear itself looks pretty small. Yeah, this, it's, the, the, the tears are small, but they, yeah, the that's, why, become... that's why you get the cyst. Yeah. If it was large, uh, you, you just get a, um, right. a bunch of fluid inside the knee and out, outside the knee. Yeah. Jason? Um, looks like, like the one a, we're looking at here. Horizontal tear at the uh, body of the lateral meniscus, and there's a a large perimeniscal cyst extending uh, superior and laterally, and it looks like there's some debris in there too. So the, this is uh, these become more complex the longer they're there as you get parts of it dehydrating over time and uh, you get multiple components and sometimes you can even get some extravasation of fluid uh, from these. But these, as you can see, become very, very large. So looking at some of the uh, uh, literature, there are poor outcomes after arthroscopic surgery with partial meniscectomy, increase with cartilage loss. We already saw this stuff, same compartment. I don't know, we don't need to go through that again. And then, so the question is, what morphological properties of meniscus correlate with progression of osteoarthritis? Uh, and so they looked at multiple measurements of the meniscus, and only central uh, extrusion correlated with osteoarthritis progression in this particular paper in skeletal radiology. So this is, uh, uh, and we'll talk more about well, we've already talked some about uh, central extrusion. That's typically associated with uh, root tears or also with large degenerative tears of the, of the meniscus. 
Okay. Now, uh, the people have also looked at MRI uh, in menisci before and after running a marathon. And after running a marathon, is what uh, they found was that the volume and water content of the menisci decreased, and then it normalized again at 10 to 48 hours. And uh, superficial of the medial, medial area showed the greatest changes. Uh, so with uh, with a lot of pounding like this, you you can get uh, some mild uh, water changes within within the meniscus and dehydration. We're going to talk more about the effect of running and marathon running on on uh, disease of the meniscus. And I don't know if we I mean of the knee. And I don't know if we're going to do that now or a little bit later. But there's some surprising things about running. Uh, that we've just learned recently about the positive effects of running on the knee. We've already thought, always thought that if you did a lot of running that you're going to traumatize the knee and over time that would be bad for the knee. And it, it turns out that that's not, not always the case. But we'll get to that later. So uh, let's see, whose turn is it now? It's Robert, I think. So what is the role of arthroscopic partial mastectomy for the joints and tears? I guess they're, from what we talked about earlier, I don't think there would be little to no role since it's just degenerative. So we've kind of gone over this repeatedly. This is a paper published in New England Journal of Medicine in 2013, which was very controversial because they, they actually randomized patients at the uh, uh, VA hospital, and they did sham surgery on half of them and real surgery on the other half. Uh, obviously, it's sham surgery. They just go in, uh, kind of introduce the, the arthroscope, and then pull it back out again without doing anything. And uh, what they found is that there were no significant differences at six months between those who had uh, surgery and didn't have surgery. Though there was a little bit of problem in that uh, some of the patients, when they uh, uh, continued to be symptomatic, they actually then thought it would, they had to go in and actually do surgery on them. Uh, but if you try to, uh, try to statistically correct for the confounding aspect that some of these patients ended up having to break out and have surgery, uh, the statistics really show that there was no differences at six months between sham surgery and, arthros and, regular sur and, and arthroscopic surgery for patients with degenerative tears, which were not unstable. Uh, okay, let's see. Tayson, here's another question. Is arthroscopic surgery beneficial in treating non-traumatic degenerative medial meniscal tears? This is a separate study. Study. This one was published in an orthopedics journal. I'm going to say, based on the orthopedics, <laughs> yes. Okay, so they looked at five-year outcomes between surgery and non-surgical no. groups. And they found that they were no st significant differences in outcome at five years between whether they had surgery or did not have surgery. Okay. One of, one of the things, though, that you have to take, take uh, uh, in, in content uh, is that even uh, if you have a degenerative uh, meniscus and, and if there's a flap, that uh, uh, causes giving way of the knee and chronic effusions, uh, it, I, I think it's uh, worthwhile to go in and remove that flap uh, and not do too much to the knee otherwise. Um, and that will probably help the patient from the giving way and so on. So um, I don't think you can just uh, uh, make a comment that uh, it's no, you never operate on these. Uh, sometimes you just have to, uh, or the knee locks, um, and it's a degenerative tear in a degenerative, uh, a degenerated knee. Uh, yeah. you, you have to remove the tissue from the block. So, uh, and, John. Well, you cannot be too general in uh, in 
I mean, you can be general if you want to, but uh, you cannot always make statements where. Uh, yeah, J J John, in almost all of these, in almost all of these papers, they 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 excluded people who had locking or catching, and they also t typically excluded patients who had unstable meniscal tears. I I, I read the papers, but some. Some of them were uh, just a little, okay, not not quite convincing to me. Okay, okay. Uh, here's here's another paper, uh, Elior. Uh, what's the effect of early surgery versus physical therapy on knee function among patients with non-obstructive meniscal tears? By non-obstructive, they mean patients without locking or clicking or instability of the meniscal tear on MR. That's what non-obstructive means here. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, I wonder if the yeah physical therapy patients did better. Okay. Well, this study was designed to see if it didn't, if, whether they did worse or not. Mm -hmm. And what they found is that the physical therapy patients did not do worse okay. than those over 24 months who had Surgery. Okay. Uh, Robert, what is the impact of arthroscopic torsion mastectomy? It depends on the kind of therapy that's done. Uh, if you have a knee that doesn't, um, and that doesn't have normal motion, and you try to force uh, the knee, which is, let's say, uh, has degenerative arthritis, and you try to force the issue in terms of trying to get mo more motion. Uh, sometimes you, you have uh, more problems with uh, therapy, um, aggressive therapy, than, than you do with just a patient doing active exercises that, that you can teach in about five minutes or so. Okay. Uh, I, I did not use physical therapy very often in patients. Uh, maybe my patients were smart enough to to remember what I told them in the five minutes that I spent with them. Good. Robert, what do you think? I think it would accelerate osteoarthritis and degenerative change. That was not thought to be the case for years. It was thought to be that the abnormal meniscus would cause increased trauma to the articular cartilage and you would get worse arthros, uh, worse progression of degenerative disease. And that's why it was a very common procedure was called a clean out, where you'd go in and remove the frayed edges of the articular cartilage in the menisci. Uh, this study uh, found that uh, if you do that, it leads to significant increase in arthritic changes. Uh, so this is a paper back in 1995, and uh, kind of this accumulation of papers really has to the position now where in the United States, uh, this, quote, clean-out procedure is no longer covered by any of the uh, Medicare or any of the insurance companies uh, yeah. at the current time. Yeah, people used to um, debride de the knee, so-called, and uh, try to remove uh, any small fragments that are floating around in a degenerative knee or an arthritic knee. Um, and um, usually that, that, that didn't give you any benefit at all. And some knees came out far worse than they started with. Uh, the reason being is you, you, do, you can do trauma if you have a knee that's tight and you start sticking um, the arthroscope in, into the tissue, you produce uh, more damage. So um, the best is to leave it alone. And usually these people are of the age when they can have a knee replacement done. Thank you, John. Um, and then you can do some single compartment Procedures. That's what we started with uh, years ago in the early 70s. Uh, well, actually, it's 69, 70. That's when I first uh, uh, put in um, 
unique compartment. Half half knee uh, replacements with yeah. Dr. Marmer. We'll, we'll we'll talk about the surgeries later. Yeah, I, I, I know we will, John. I just kind of brought it up. Uh, Good. Taysen, what do you think about this one? All right, so we got coronal and sagittal views of the knee. Uh, very uh, truncated appearance of the posterior horn lateral meniscus on the sagittal view, and we see this uh, large gap on the coronal view, maybe a root yeah. there? Well, or uh, I don't know. The root's probably intact back here. Uh, this patient had a partial meniscectomy, uh -huh. so they removed a large part of the meniscus here. This is a very large partial meniscectomy, including a lot of the body as well as the posterior horn. A lot of residual degenerative signal within the, the body of the residual rim there. Uh, so this is on 722. Now if we go back, here's before the prior surgery. So what do you think is going on here? There was a small peripheral tear in the body, so right? Yeah, right over there. And a little free edge tear probably there. But you can see the bulk of the meniscus was intact. The articular cartilages look like they're intact at that time. Yeah. So, you know, here's kind of the difference. Uh, we have this degenerative tear of the body, but the free edge was intact before. They went in and removed most of this uh, central part of the meniscus, leaving some of the peripheral degenerative parts. Uh, we don't see the cartilage quite as well before, but it looked like the cartilage was intact before uh, on, a, on the, all the other sequences. And now we can see that there are areas of probably full thickness cartilage loss, and lo as well as some subchondral edema on this knee uh, after surgery. And if I was to guess, uh, this knee is unstable. Yeah, right. Yeah, so this is a, actually a large amount of meniscus removed, so the, the patient is going to have some instability because you no longer have the meniscus there to properly stabilize the knee. And we think that's what leads to a lot of the degenerative changes which occur. Okay. Oh, that's really fast. So here's another, here's another paper where they looked at the impact of, long, of arthroscopic partial meniscectomy on development of osteoarthritis. And, uh, here, this one. and uh, the bottom line on this particular paper from 2001 is that meniscectomy is associated with long-term symptoms and functional limitations, uh, especially in women. And I like to say, especially if the surgery is to the lateral compartment. Uh, women who have partial meniscectomies of the lateral meniscus a number of studies have shown that they do not do well. So, okay, here we go. Okay. Have a question. Okay. Can marathon running improve knee damage of middle-aged adults, a prospective cohort study? So, so these were patients in England, not yeah, patients, yeah, who uh, presented with knee pain in, the middle age, in their middle age, uh, which I think is mostly in the 40s and 50s. And uh, uh, they did a study where they took uh, 82, I guess, healthy adults, uh, had an MRI six months before their first marathon was scheduled. <clears throat> and uh, they had seven, 71 completed four months of training and a marathon, and then repeated the MR scan about two and a half weeks after the marathon was run. And mm -hmm. uh, a number of these patients had cartilage loss. A number of them had subchondral bone marrow edema. Uh, what do you think the results of the study showed? This is the British Medical Journal. Well, you alluded to something mm -hmm. counterintuitive, so maybe they, they, they regenerated their cartilage yeah. possibly? That's what they found is the, the subchondral bone edema pretty much went away. Okay. So those patients who had subchondral bone edema that we see typically with articular cartilage disease, uh, uh, after running the marathon, instead of having more edema, they basically, almost all of them had no edema. So it markedly improved the edema scores. There are now some more recent papers that have shown that as well. Uh, the, the only, and their symptoms were much improved over this time. 
the menisci were unchanged. A lot of them had degenerative meniscal tears, but surprisingly, those meniscal tears were not worsened by doing or training and doing a marathon. They had a little bit of increased cartilage loss in the lateral patellar facet uh, and some signal in the submembranosa tendon, but none of these were symptomatic. Yeah. So the finding was that uh, uh, that the long distance running, uh, it, these patients actually had less symptoms than they had before because of long had symptoms. Uh, but their MR scan was actually improved and didn't didn't worsen. So uh, now, why is this the case? Uh, when we talk about cartilage, you know, I don't think anybody really knows. Uh, but a lot of this had to do uh, with with cartilage. And what we'll find when we talk about cartilage and the metabolism of cartilage is that cartilage is an avascular structure if it's normal cartilage. The diffusion coefficient of nutrients into the cartilage where it gets its nutrition is, is primarily from the, the joint fluid, a little bit maybe from the peripheral vasculature uh, uh, in the subchondral bone. Uh, uh, and actually the, the diffusion is very slow. So if you just sit around all day long, uh, your, your articular cartilage is not going to get adequate nutrition. The way it gets nutrition is if you actually put pressure and relieve pressure on the cartilage, it basically pumps uh, a joint fluid into the articular cartilage. When you put pressure on it, it squeezes the fluid out. When you relieve pressure, the fluid is sucked in, and that brings in nutrients, and it markedly improves the diffusion coefficient of nutrients into the, to the, to the cartilage. So actually... Uh, Loading and unloading the knee and all the other cartilages of the body is actually very important for nutrition to the cartilage. And we'll talk a lot more about this when we do about cartilage. But I think that explains why a lot of, especially overweight people who just sit around all day long, tend to get a lot of degenerative disease of their knee. For a long time, we thought that was because just the weight produced a lot of trauma on the knee. Mm -hmm. But that's probably not the main problem. The main problem is that they're probably inactive and they don't get adequate nutrition, and that leads to death of the chondrocytes and destruction of the articular cartilage. Uh, one thing, uh, though, uh, anybody that can run the marathon uh, You're right. really doesn't have pain in the knee and swelling. And if you don't have an effusion and pain, and you can run a marathon, the chances are is you've got a pretty good knee from the start. So continue to do it, and uh, and that'll keep the knee intact. But if you have pain and effusions uh, before and after running, uh, which you probably cannot do, uh, you're going to have a problem. Yeah, that's probably true. I don't, I don't remember... Whether, whether they had effusions or not, I don't remember if that being in the study. Yeah, and that, uh, these are all the things and, that sometimes most, people forget to put in. And these were considered healthy, so they probably didn't have a lot of knee pain, though uh, they had a lot of changes, uh, change, subchondral bone edema changes on the MR scan. Some of them did, yeah. but not all of them. I feel like you might be hard-pressed to convince somebody who's like morbid with, uh, you know, years of knee pain to... You know, start a regimen of long distance for running. Well, yeah. Uh, uh, also, once you lose the articular cartilage, uh, you're you're not going to grow it back in humans. And no, other animals you do. Once you lose it, you're not going to yeah. get it back. And, and there are people right now who believe that in the next few decades, we'll figure out how to regrow uh, articular cartilage in human knees. But right now, you can't. But there are a lot of animal models where the animals can, and uh, there's a lot of biochemistry going on right now to understanding how you can flip the switch to allow regeneration of cartilage. And don't, don't, don't use a rabbit for a study. It, it won't work. Okay, uh, Robert, what's happening here? So we have two. I learned that in the 80s. 
Yeah, I've actually done um, before we go on. Yeah. Take time. Uh, your study uh, with rabbits is kind of instructive here. Uh, why don't you tell us what happened when you took normal rabbits and forced them to be inactive and not put pressure? I think it was the hip oh, joint, right. wasn't it? If you, if you take a, a rabbit and you put a cast on the rabbit's leg um, and then take the cast off, and uh, look inside the knee. Uh, usually, the knee is a little swollen, and uh, and you find the degenerative changes in the knee uh, after a very short period of time of immobilization. I I think I went as far as a week or so before I took the cast off, and so uh, and and during the that's why a rabbit is not a very good. Um, animal to, to do studies uh, in terms of uh, the knee uh, for, for ligaments or whatever. Actually, uh, uh, rats are probably better, to, but uh, uh, sheep are the best. Yeah. Okay, so we I have almost two went into doing sheep. I got a half a million dollar um, offer from a company and, uh, and then the company got sued for silicone breast implants uh, causing problems they, they, that that was uh, not the case but they lost a lot of money so that uh, the juries couldn't <laughs> that came in the wrong direction Actually, silicone is not going to cause problems all over your body. Uh, it'll cause a problem in the area where they where they fragment, but uh, but not uh, go through the body uh, yeah, and cause symptoms. So we have two coronals of the knee, one dated January, and then a follow up in March. Uh, the January one looks relatively okay. Maybe some blunting of the free edge of the medial meniscus, but the follow-up shows, I think, a little more blunting and then some cartilage loss and subchondral edema. Uh, okay. Here are the axial images. Uh, so on the right, it looks like there's... Uh, they had surgery, some sort of scraping? Yeah, they had surgery in between. Gotcha. Yeah, so you see that defect on the, on the right there. Yeah, yes. right there. Arthroscopy oh. changes, John. Well, I was going to say that, that this is an arthroscopic, post-arthroscopic knee. That's that, that's the problem. Yeah. Somebody is... somebody scraped the articular surface. Yeah. So this is probably arthroscopic. Well, exactly. That's uh, man man-made. So, uh, so what are we really looking at when it comes to meniscal tears? Uh, what we really want to look for are uh, if the tear is degenerative or not. And again, it's primarily signal intensity and the sharpness of the margins of the tear. It's also the shape of the tear. Acute tears uh, tend to be uh, more radial and uh, less horizontal. Horizontal are more degenerative type tears, maybe because of the the uh, differential. Yeah, difference in coefficient of friction over long times, that smiley thought that we talked about before, uh, because these are considered non-surgical lesions unless they're unstable and the patient's symptomatic. Uh, if you do have an unstable meniscus, especially if it's one that has nice sharp black margins, uh, that the data shows, especially if they're athletes, it's best to prepare them uh, not to do partial meniscectomies, uh, as we say here. So why don't we stop here and we'll we'll go on and talk about some other uh, traumatic injuries to the menisci tomorrow. Okay. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a good evening, everybody. Thank you, John. Thank you. Take care, John. Yeah.